Well, good morning, church family. Guys, we have the awesome privilege today of taking the Lord's Supper together. So the last couple weeks, we had uh, baptisms in the middle of our service. And baptism, right, is a picture of the spiritual truth of our salvation, the entrance into our community. And what we are doing collectively as a congregation is we are acknowledging that is the gospel that saves you. And we are rejoicing with believers who come and give testimony. And when we take the Lord's Supper together, we are a family that is continuing in the gospel. Taking the gospel, uh, the elements together as a picture of Jesus' body and blood and the covenant, and we are continuing that gospel participation. If you came in and you did not grab elements, uh, raise your hand and some deacons will pop up around you and make sure that you have those. Uh, If you are a born-again believer, you are invited to participate in uh, the Lord's Supper with us. Uh, If you are a guest this morning and you're here just checking us out, just checking out this Jesus, awesome. We are glad that you are here and you are welcome. We do ask that you do not participate in the uh, supper with us, and that is simply because uh, you are examining, you are still thinking through this process, and that is good. We want to encourage you, okay? But to us who know Jesus, the bread and the juice, it is a covenant. This is something very deep and intimate that we do with our Savior, all right? So church family, the entire service, we're gonna be moving towards the Lord's Supper, so be preparing your heart. We never wanna take it in an unworthy manner. The other good news I have this morning is we are finishing our story with Joseph. This summer we've walked through uh, the story of Joseph in the uh, latter half of the book of Genesis. You can turn with me in your Bibles to Genesis 45. Genesis 45. If you're here for the first time, it's okay. I'm going to quickly recap the story for you so you can find your spot. And then this morning we're going to finish that story. So Joseph is uh, the son of Jacob, and he has, uh, there are 12 of them in all. He has 11 brothers, and Joseph is Jacob's favorite, and his brothers become jealous of that favoritism and the fact that God began to reveal himself to Joseph uh, (coughs) through dreams, Um, and Joseph told his brothers those dreams, and they Out of their jealousy and anger and evil, they sold him into slavery, into Egypt, wishing him dead, thinking him dead. And Joseph was uh, in slavery for, or he was enslaved for 13 years. But God had a plan. We're going to see all of that come to full fruition today, full circle. God had a plan. Joseph was able to interpret dreams. He interpreted Pharaoh's dream, and God lifted him out uh, to the number two in all of Egypt. He became Pharaoh's prime minister, his right-hand man. The dream was that there would be seven years of plenty, uh, harvest, lots of uh, fullness of the land, followed by seven years of famine. And Pharaoh put Joseph in charge of it all. As, uh, as a, uh, an organizer, as an administrator, he put Joseph over all of it. Well, wouldn't you know it, after the seven years of plant, plenty, when the famine hits, that the brothers have to come and buy food from Joseph in Egypt, because the famine was in Israel as well. Well, when Joseph sees his brothers... Okay. By the way, the Lord had worked in Joseph's life to provide healing. We, we talked about that, vertical healing, about letting go of the bitterness, making sure that Joseph got off the throne of judgment. And so when Joseph sees his brothers, it is now time to take this, the second step, and that is, is there going to be full reconciliation? As we walk through this this summer, what we realize is reconciliation requires repentance. It requires dealing with sin, okay? Jesus commands that we would love our enemies, but if there's going to be relationship on the other side, then we have to deal with sin. 
and there had to be repentance. So Joseph tested his brothers. Uh, he, he, uh, there's a lot of details here. Let me quickly go through. Uh, all the brothers come back. Joseph tests his brothers by uh, planting a cup in Benjamin's sack. And uh, Benjamin was the father's now favorite and uh, testing to see if his brothers would betray uh, Benjamin the same way that he did, uh, that they did him. But instead, they actually come back, they fight for Benjamin. They actually uh, all say, take us all as slaves along with Benjamin. And when Joseph says, no, only Benjamin is going to be slave, Judah, the brother who sold him into slavery, Judah stepped forward and said, take me instead. Take me instead of Benjamin. So upon repentance, now it is time for the grand reveal. We went through this last time, but I want to read it again to you. Okay, Genesis 45. You can see it on the screen. I'm going to read verse 1 and then skip down to verse 4. Then Joseph could not control himself before all those who stood by him, and he cried out, how everyone go out from me. So then it's just Joseph with his brothers. Then Joseph said to his brothers, I am your brother Joseph, whom you sold into Egypt. Now do not be grieved or angry with yourselves because you sold me here. For God sent me before you to preserve life. For the famine has been in this land these two years, and there are still five years with which there will be neither plowing nor harvesting. God sent me before you to preserve for you a remnant in the earth and to keep you alive by a great deliverance. Now, therefore, it is not you who sent me here, but God. And he has made me a father to Pharaoh and a lord of all of his household and a ruler over all the land of Egypt. All right, will you pray with me? And then we'll continue. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word this morning. As we unfold this story, as we've been applying it to our lives, Father, I pray this morning that we would get a fresh picture of your lavish grace of how abundant and overflowing and joy-filled your grace is to us. I pray all across this room, as we deal with the sin in our lives and as we pause to think about your goodness to us, God, would you lift our heads and enlighten our hearts. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, so before we get back into the personal account, because that's what we're going to walk through. We're going to walk through the personal account and the lavish grace. There's something really important that I need us to focus on here as we take a little step back about what Joseph said here, okay? Uh, because what he says is robust and rich theology as Joseph speaks to his brothers in this grand reveal. So listen to this. Joseph said that even in their evil actions against him, that God was still on his throne. That God's sovereign plans were coming to be. Okay? Not only was it God's plan that his representative, that Joseph be exalted to the prime minister okay, in all of Egypt and be the one who saves the most powerful nation in the world. But God is also orchestrating events within the promised family of Israel. He's working out promises to that family. These events are going to lead to Israel as a people at the end of the chapter coming to Egypt and in one generation being made slaves and then the exodus. In fact, can I remind you that in Genesis 15, verse 13, God actually told Abraham, Joseph's great-grandfather, that your descendants will be enslaved 400 years in a foreign land. See, God's sovereign plans are coming to be. 
Even in the midst of the evil, even in the midst of the confusion, God is still on his throne. And I remind you of that because that very truth applies to your life just as much as theirs. We will go through life and evil will befall us, but God is greater and he is writing the story of your life and it will be accomplished. All right, now it's time to jump back into the personal account. So Joseph has the grand reveal. Remember, there was so much wailing, there was so much emotion that all the Egyptians are put on high notice. Like, what is going on in there? Well, word quickly gets to Pharaoh that Joseph's family is here. Pharaoh loves Joseph, right? He has, he has saved the empire. And so he hears the news that Joseph has a family. We didn't know where this guy came from. He just came out of prison. Joseph has a family. And then Pharaoh is so excited, he begins to uh, bark out orders, okay? They need to move to Egypt. And they need to get the best of all the farmland. So Joseph will stay here, but they are to go back and bring the whole family and move to Egypt. Listen to Pharaoh's orders 45, 19. Now you are ordered, do this. Take wagons from the land of Egypt for your little ones and for your wives and bring your father and come. Do not concern yourself with your goods for the best of all the land of Egypt is yours. Then the sons of Israel did so and Joseph gave them wagons according to the command of Pharaoh and gave them provisions for the journey. To each of them he gave changes of garments. But to Benjamin, he gave 300 pieces of silver and five changes of garments. And to his father, he sent as follows, 10 donkeys loaded with the best of things of Egypt and 10 female donkeys loaded with grain and bread and substance for his father on the journey. So I need you to picture the scene that we are two years into the devastation of, of the most severe famine. The fields are brown and dusty as the heat rises. Water is scarce. The livestock are disgustingly skinny. Right? The, the owners can't afford to feed them. Sickness and frailty and death reign in the air. In that setting, along comes an opulent caravan rejoicing. The finest clothes, bags of silver, Wagons full of servants, followed by strong, healthy animals, loaded with grain and bread and oils and dried fruit. Substances that no one has seen in two years. The scene is shocking. It is so out of place. Who are these people? Why, I've heard they are the brothers of Joseph, the prime minister of all of Egypt, the one who has saved all peoples from the famine. Now, I need you to hold this snapshot in your mind, this scene of overflowing blessing and joy and favor in the midst of such scarcity. Do you see it? What did they do to earn such favor? What did the brothers do to earn such favor? Nothing. Nothing. They repented, but nothing. In fact, they did the opposite of nothing. 
They were evil. Their very own evil act of hatred and betrayal of Joseph is what God turned to good. God turned that act into their salvation. And what do they deserve for their evil? You say justice. Justice from a holy God. Justice from Joseph. But instead, what have they received? Grace. Lavish grace. Right? Not only did they not get what they deserve, but they get abundance and favor in return. Lavish grace. Picture this scene. Because, friend, this is the gospel of Jesus Christ. This is the gospel. Consider with me the crowd in Jerusalem that shouted, crucify him, as Pilate pleaded. Why? What evil has he done? But yet they cried, crucify him, crucify him, all the more. And as he hung in agony, he prayed for them. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And 50 days later, at Pentecost, when the Holy Spirit fell, and the disciples began to, with the commotion, pour over into the streets, And then Peter is pushed forward to preach in front of thousands in Jerusalem, probably at the footsteps now of the temple. It was there that Peter pressed them. This Jesus, whom you crucified by your evil deeds, this one has been resurrected by the predetermined plan of God. As victory over sin, as victory over death. And under conviction, the crowd cries out, What must we do? And Peter in 2 38 said to them, Repent, and each of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise, you say, what promise? The promise of salvation is for you and for your children and for all who are far off, as many as the Lord our God will call to himself. Lavish grace. The very act led to salvation of their souls. Forgiveness of that very sin and all your sins and the gift of the Holy Spirit inside of you, no longer in the temple, now in you. All of that upon nothing more than repentance And that salvation, it wasn't just for them. It was for their family and their children and for all who come to the foot of the cross and kneel before the name of Jesus Christ for their sin. There is no God like Jesus where holiness and love meet, who absorbs the injustice And in return, joyfully lavishes grace the moment that you come to him in repentance. Stop and think about this. Do you think Joseph delighted to give his brothers abundance? Absolutely. It was Joseph's joy. He was so overjoyed 
that their relationship had been restored. He longed for that. And the moment he saw repentance, he threw off his garbs and he wept and he hugged them and then he was overjoyed to give them abundance and blessing out of his over. He gave and gave and gave and he wanted to. Yet our unbelieving hearts are so timid to believe that our Savior joys to lavish forgiveness and grace upon us the moment that we come to the cross. I've used this illustration before. It's so good. It's from Gentle and Lowly. A compassionate doctor spent his life savings and years developing a vaccine that would cure a contagious disease that was killing people in a far remote jungle. And he spent his very last dollar to fly there with the vials of of his cure. But the afflicted refused his care. Some are scared. Many are filled with pride and distrust. They say, I will just take care of myself. Heal on my own terms. Finally, out of desperation, a few brave young men step forward to receive the care being provided. Now let me ask you, in that moment, What does the doctor feel? Joy. Joy. With each and every single one, joy. Now, how much more if the diseased are not strangers but his very own family? Guys, this is why Jesus painted the picture of Luke 15 of the parable of the prodigal son. That when the prodigal son returns, it's a picture of the joy of the father. That the father was sitting on the front porch and he was watching. He was looking for the, he was longing for the return of his son. And the moment he saw him, he did not sit, he did not scheme, he did not make him go through any sort of routine of show me how uh, upset or or, uh, repentant you are, any of that. He got up and he ran. He ran to meet the son. And the son begins to go through his rehearsed uh, kind of repentance speech. And he hugs him. He throws his arms around him. He, He throws a robe around him. He turns to his servant and says, we are having a feast The joy of the Father. The joy. Listen, beloved, you are that son. You are that daughter. And it is God's delight to save you and to call you his own and to lavish grace upon you. But the fact is, is that So many of us in this room right now do not genuinely believe that that lavish grace is for us. We seriously question God's countenance towards us. Listen to me again. God is completely satisfied in the son's work on your behalf. Completely satisfied. And the son delights to overflow in joy the same way that Joseph delighted to overflow in lavish grace upon his brothers. So the caravan makes it home to Jacob. He's anxious, right? He had sent Benjamin with the rest. 
He has no idea about Joseph. Remember, Joseph does not come with the brothers. As the caravan first arrives, they run and they shout to Jacob, Joseph is alive. Joseph is alive. Jacob, of course, doesn't believe it, right? How, what? Joseph? I was just hoping Benjamin came home. Joseph is alive. But as he sees the wave of the caravan and the absolute abundance and the overflow, yeah, he's the prime minister in Egypt. And the stories check out. Suddenly he says, my son has resurrected from the dead. My son is alive. And so Jacob and his family and all the son's families, right, they hear Joseph and Pharaoh's offer to move to Goshen in Egypt, and they pack everything up. Now, his family has just been saved from the famine, okay? Think about the relief of the provision. And all of that is great, but think about Jacob's excitement to see Joseph again. But then in 46 verses 1 through 4, Jacob does something marvelous. It's a picture of his faith. His faith was rocky throughout. This is an incredible moment of Jacob's faith because before leaving the land of Israel, the land that was promised to his grandfather, Abraham, Jacob pauses. He gets to the very edge and he pauses to meet with God and to worship and to give a sacrifice. And at that moment, God shows up in a vision and calms Jacob's fears. God assures Jacob, I am going with you. Do not fear. Go to Egypt. I will go with you. And when the time is right, I will bring you back. Now, what's so incredible here? This moment is similar to like Exodus 33. Because in Exodus 33, it's right after the golden calf when, when God is so upset with Israel that he says to Moses, I'll give you guys the promised land, but I'm not going in with you. You guys can have all the provision of the land flowing with milk and honey, and I'll give it to you, but I'm not going with you. And Moses, in the wilderness, says, God, if you don't go, I'm not going. We're not going. We are nothing without your presence. The provision, the abundance is nothing without you. That is... That is similar to what Jacob does here. All the provision that's ahead in Israel, or or sorry, in Egypt, right? For For him to leave the land of famine, he says, listen, God, if you are not in this, I don't wanna go. Incredible moment of faith. Judah led the way to Goshen, and the caravan finally arrives. The day is actually here. Joseph hasn't seen his father in more than 22 years. 22 years ago, when his father said, go check on your brothers, probably the last thing he said was, son, be safe. And remember, I always love you. Joseph was 17. He is now 39 or 40. Genesis 46, 29. Joseph prepared his chariot and went up to Goshen to meet his father Israel. As soon as he appeared before him, he fell on his neck and wept on his neck a long time. What an understatement. A long time. 
Then Israel said to Joseph, now let me die, since I've seen your face, that you are still alive. The years have changed him in so many ways, and yet they haven't. There is my son with the same glimmer of hope in his eyes. I'm sure for Jacob there was a slideshow of memories as he flashes back to all those important moments as a kid. He says, now I can die in peace for I've seen that my boy Joseph is alive. Beloved, these are the types of reunions that you and I will have in heaven. Oh, what it will be like to see my father again. Now, for our purposes, we need to move quickly because I have one final landing spot to end in our series. I got to quickly skip over. Jacob is going to bless uh, each of his children. Uh, Jacob treats Joseph's sons, Ephraim and Manasseh, as his own, and he gives Joseph a double portion. And Judah, the other hero of our story, whose life began as an absolute train wreck, okay, is told that the king's scepter will not depart from his line. David is from the tribe of Judah, followed by the ultimate David, Jesus, the lion of the tribe of Judah. So you need to read these last five chapters for yourself. There's a lot of really good details. But for our spot in chapter 50, after Jacob's death, listen to verse 15. I'm going to read 15 through 21 of chapter 50. When Joseph's brothers saw that their father was dead, they said, what if Joseph bears a grudge against us and pays us back in full for all the wrong which we did to him. So they sent a message to Joseph saying, your father charged before he died, saying, saying, thus you shall say to Joseph, please forgive, I beg you, the transgressions of your father and their sin, for they did you wrong. And now please forgive the transgressions of your servant of the God of your father. And Joseph wept when they spoke to him. Then his brothers came and fell down before him and said, Behold, we are your servants. But Joseph said to them, Do not be afraid, for am I in God's place? As for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good in order to bring about this present result, to preserve many people alive. So therefore, do not be afraid. I will provide for you and your little ones. And so he comforted them and spoke kindly to them. All right, so you get the scene. Jacob has died. So the father is dead. And suddenly the brothers become fearful. This is 17 years later, and the brothers become fearful. And they go and they stand before Joseph, and they say, before dad died, he charged us to tell you, you must forgive us. Then it says, Joseph, in response to that, he wept. Guys, Joseph is not weeping for himself. This is a different kind of weeping. Joseph is weeping for his brothers because there's a deep sadness that's here because what he now sees is that 17 years later, they haven't fully trusted his heart towards them and they can't because they don't forgive themselves 
You see, for 17 years, he's been enjoying them. He's been blessing them. He's been trying to redeem the years that they have lost. And for them to respond this way now can only mean that they have never truly been able to accept his full forgiveness. It has always been, I guess, dads protecting us. They have been driven by fear and not love. Their hearts have always regulated how close they could get to Joseph. And Joseph weeps because they are still so broken. And they haven't experienced God's freedom the way that he has. And beloved, when I read this, I cannot help but think about so many Christians whose heart still refuses to believe the fullness of Christ's forgiveness for their sins. They filter his grace as if it only applies to ordinary sins and never to their heinous ones where they receive forgiveness for the moment. And then the enemy persuades them that that is simply too good to be true. And like the brothers, years later, they are still waiting for retribution, that God is going to get them back because very well, that is what they deserve. And Jesus weeps. Because you do not fully trust his word when he tells you that you are forgiven. Jesus weeps because you are still so broken. Jesus weeps because you have not experienced the forgiveness that he has purchased for you. Jesus weeps because you do not accept his full forgiveness. But you know what else is incredible about this story? The way that Joseph responds. Because Joseph does not respond with anger, even though they continue to struggle and question his character. It ends with Joseph comforting them and speaking kindly to them. Friend, allow yourself to be overwhelmed with the kindness of Jesus. Listen to these verses out of Hebrews chapter four. For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who has been tempted in all things as we are, yet without sin. Therefore, let us draw near with confidence to the throne of grace. Look at what the throne is called. It is called a throne of grace so that you may receive mercy and find grace to help in your time of need. And then just two verses later in chapter five, listen to what it says. He can deal gently with the ignorant and wayward since he himself is beset with weakness. Ignorant and wayward are not too kind ways to say like mild sinners. It's almost certainly what the author of Hebrews has in mind is accidental sins and deliberate sins. Therefore, meaning all sins. He's covering all sins. So who is it that Jesus deals gently with whenever they come to him? Sinners. All sinners. You. That he is calm and tender and soothing and restrained. Like Joseph to his brothers, he is kind. So beloved, as we move towards the Lord's Supper, I want you to prepare the bread. My favorite account of the Lord's Supper is in Luke chapter 22. 
There's a detail in Luke 22 that's not included in the other gospels. It's something Jesus says that night. But to to really comprehend it, you, you have to remember, Jesus knows everything that is about to happen. He knows Peter's betrayal, he, uh, Peter's denial. He knows Judas' tra- betrayal. He knows the crowd is going to turn against him. He knows all the pain, all the... He knows everything that is about to come. Moments after this, he's going to go to the garden and sweat blood because he knows what's about to come. But in this moment at the Lord's Supper, in Luke 22, Jesus, sitting around the table with his disciples, said this, I could not wait to share this meal with you. I could not wait. There's Jesus, full of joy and delight because he knows what this new covenant means for his disciples. He said, I couldn't wait to give you this like a gift Be overwhelmed by the kindness of the Lord. So with the bread, as you hold it in your hands, I'm going to give you just a moment. Know that upon repentance, believer, you are granted full forgiveness. Full So let me ask you, before you take this, are there things that your heart holds back in unbelief? Let me implore you. You are limiting your relationship with Jesus. You are governing. You are filtering the grace that he has for you. He desires so much more. I'm going to give you just a few moments, and then we will take this together as a family. there at the dinner, he broke some bread and he gave it to his disciples and he said, take, eat. This is my body that has been broken for your sins. Now, as you hold the cup, prepare it so we can take it together. Beloved, not only has your Savior forgiven, fully forgiven your sins, fully, but he loves to lavish grace upon you. It is his delight to write your story, to give you what you don't deserve, goodness, that overflows. So as you hold this, I need you to celebrate in your heart with your Savior. And before we drink, I need you to drink in the lavish grace of Jesus. And in the same way, he took a cup 
He said to his disciples, this is the blood of a new covenant for the forgiveness of your sins. Will you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we rejoice today. We rejoice in your saving grace that you sent your son, that it is your delight to be known by your mercy and your grace and your goodness. You are holy. You are righteous. There is no one like you. And yet, simply upon repentance, you delight to save and lavish grace upon your children. I praise you for that. I pray all across this room that your children would know that and would walk in that in complete forgiveness and healing. And Father, if there's anyone here this morning that does not know you, God, that they would know that right now they can bow their knee at the foot of the cross and receive what we are screaming about, what we are overflowing about, your grace and goodness. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Church family, with our final moment here together, the praise team's going to come and lead us in one final song. If you still have business to do with the Lord, please do that. Sit in your seat. You can ride out on the response pad in front of you. But most of us, right, are going to stand and we're going to sing in faith. We're going to sing in celebration of the victory of all that Jesus has done. We get to give our voices back to him because he is so good to us. Would you stand?